on the edge of death, what is waiting for us? Life on fast forward? Light at the end of the tunnel? Overwhelming peace and calm. Through all centuries and cultures, this is how people have described it. Can we really see into the afterlife and return to tell the tale? Or is it just a reaction of chemicals in our brains? Unlock the fifth dimension as science opens the door to near death. Resuscitation after a cardiac arrest. The doctors managed to revive the patient. A brush with death. And for a few people, something else. It felt wonderful to be outside of my body. And when I came back into my body, I felt very heavy. And then I started experiencing all the pain associated with being back in it. I was never afraid of the near-death experience. Uh, it was a beautiful experience because of the beam of light. I know there is life after death. I know there is something on the other side. I've had a similar experience. I know what it feels like. I know how dramatic and life-changing it can be. But I did investigate many of them, very many, as many as I could. And never did I find any convincing evidence at all for paranormal phenomena during near-death experiences. Near-death experiences, or NDEs, are what science calls these events. For the thousands touched by them, it can be a mystical, life-changing experience. But are these genuine glimpses into the afterlife beyond the grave, or the chemical reactions of the dying brain? Eastbourne, England, December 1979. 18-year-old Jeanette Atkinson is in intensive care. She's developed a serious blood clot in her lungs after a simple knee operation. Her condition is critical. I arrived at the hospital in a very bad state. I was coughing blood and I was in considerable pain because I could not breathe and I didn't know what was wrong, and I was very, very scared and very frightened at the time. Her mother, Daphne, despaired for her daughter. The more ill you are, the nearer the door you are. I was not expected to live, so I was close to the door. I felt then that she would never come out of hospital because to me it was such a danger point that she was in the first bed in that ward. Daphne was filled with guilt. Trying to help, she had massaged her daughter's knee every day after the operation, not realising she was making things much worse. I was breaking up this clot that was in her leg. And I always blame myself for the fact that I nearly killed her. 
I had seven blood clots in my lungs, three on one side and four on the other. And one blood clot normally kills anybody, and seven. It's a bit of a miracle, really, I've been told that I'm still here. After 48 hours, Jeanette gave up fighting. Above the doors was a clock, and the time was nine o'clock at night. Then the light changed, and I felt very calm, very peaceful, and I, hadn't had any, I didn't have any pain. I could breathe, and I thought, great, you know, I'm getting better. And then I started floating, and I went out of my body, and I could see me in bed, and I went up on the ceiling, and started going up and down the wall, looking at all the other patients in their beds. From there, the light changed again, and around me started going very, very dark. And it was just a tube, a black tube, that was turning and turning. And at the bottom of this tube, was the most beautiful set of lights. And I was going to this light and I just wanted desperately to go to this light because it was wonderful, it was peaceful, it was serene, it was everything you wanted life to be. I almost got there. And then a voice said to me, come on you silly old cow, it's not your turn yet. And as quick as that, I was back in my bed, back in my body still looking at the clock and seeing the time as 20 past nine that night. And then it was quiet. She's convinced that in that 20 minutes, she glimpsed the afterlife. For years, she kept what had happened a secret, even from her mother. When she finally told her, the story became even stranger. She said to me afterwards, a lady came to me, and I said to her, a lady. And she described my mother perfectly, in every detail. Now, my mother died when Jeanette was three. How could a childhood memory resurface so clearly? Whatever it was that Jeanette experienced, it gave her the strength to deal with another family tragedy, the death of her own teenage daughter. Wherever she is, she is safe because of this experience I've had. I've had a little insight into the other side and I know when my time comes, my daughter will be there to take my hand and lead me through those lights at the bottom, and then I will have her forever. But right now, she's happy and she's safe. As medical science improves, more people are being saved who in earlier years would probably have died. At the same time, the number of reported NDEs seems to be growing. For believers, they can offer great comfort. Psychologist Chris French specializes in the paranormal, and he thinks that belief in these experiences is fueled by a deep and universal human need. I think so many people find the idea that near-death experiences offer a true glimpse of an afterlife so appealing is precisely because we all want to believe that we survive bodily death and that eventually we will be reunited with our loved ones who have gone before us and that when we ourselves die, it's not the end for us. Other scientists of many kinds agree with him and medicine can find rational explanations for apparently paranormal experiences. 
Susan Blackmore is a psychologist. As a 19-year-old student at Oxford University, she smoked marijuana. One night she had such an extraordinary experience, she decided to start researching the paranormal, and NDEs in particular. One night I had a dramatic out-of-the-body experience. For over two hours, it seemed to me that I was outside my body, floating around, flying around the roofs of Oxford, looking down on my own body in, in its college room with my friends, and ultimately it became a, a mystical experience. And that experience made me think, science doesn't understand this at all. And I thought then, mistakenly as it turned out, that parapsychology was the way to answer those questions. But 20 years' investigation has turned her into a sceptic. It was an experience of memory and imagination, not an experience of something actually flying over the roofs. But for many centuries, in many cultures, people have reported these experiences. There is an extraordinary consistency in their stories when describing sights and sensations of entering a new and different existence. In the Doge's Palace in Venice is a picture by the Dutch artist Hieronymus Bosch. It's called Rise into Paradise. Painted in the 16th century, his depiction of the afterlife is surprisingly familiar. People who are either actually near to death or think they're near to death often report it involves things like an out-of-body experience, the sensation of moving down a tunnel towards a bright light and perhaps meeting with a being of light. On the other side of the world, Tibet, where Buddhist beliefs have remained unchanged for centuries. Written over 1,200 years ago, the Tibetan Book of the Dead describes the journey into the afterlife. A gleaming bright light will shine white from the heart of God with such power that you hardly dare to look into it and still won't be able to steer your eyes away from it. From ancient Tibet through 16th century Europe to the present day, the light at the end of the tunnel seems to be a universal symbol for life after death. Does science have a way to explain this? Now, what happens if you are lacking oxygen or you have a severe shock or various other imbalances in the brain is that the inhibitory system gives up first, allowing a massive overstimulation of the whole visual system. And what does this look like? It looks like a bright light in the middle because there are lots and lots of cells devoted to the middle, fading off towards dark at the outside. And as that effect gets stronger, um, so the light seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you're rushing towards it and ultimately it envelops your, your whole awareness. And that's where the, where the tunnel comes from. In 1976, Robert Barcher from Germany was 10 years old when he had a terrifying accident. The results have haunted him ever since. He thinks it gave him a glimpse not only of life after death, but also his own particular future. It was very difficult to share this experience with others because it was so hard to put into words. I still find it hard to describe because there aren't any words to express such a complex experience. On the 24th of April, Robert and his brother Bruno were playing around in their parents' bathroom. I was in the bath and my brother was getting ready by the sink. He grabbed the hairdryer. Back then on Saturdays, there was a pop program on television and Rod Stewart had been on singing I Am Sailing. He was huge at the time. And there were fans blowing wind over the stars that were singing. So I was holding the hairdryer in my face and singing and pretending to be a pop star. As he danced around, the cable on the hairdryer pulled tight, pulling the hairdryer right out of his hand, and it fell straight into the bath. As 
hat ihn richtig durchgeschüttelt. Und er It just shook him. His body stretched and sank under the water. I heard his head bang on the bottom of the bath. He kept shaking. He wasn't in charge of any of his movements anymore. Und er schüttelte aber weiter in der Wanne. Er war nicht mehr Herr seiner Bewegung. Meine einzige Wahl ist loslassen. My only choice was to let go. And once I did this, I suddenly felt completely relaxed. My mind and body started feeling completely detached. A very bright light. I was flooded in light. I felt so comfortable. I didn't want to leave. And I asked for a reason why I should go back. Why do I have to go back there? Then this being, this thing, became very forceful and told me, showed me, that I still had a task to do. But I can't come now. As a teenager, and still today, Robert is convinced that his near-death experience showed him his future wife and family. You could say that a vision of a dark-haired woman and two children is something that everyone will see at some point in their lives. But this vision went much further than that. It's hard to explain, but in this vision I experienced the same emotions, the same inner feelings that I was to experience later. But the emotions Robert experienced could have a purely physical explanation. Endorphins. Stored in the brain, these act as neurotransmitters, regulating feelings of pleasure. Studies show that in the extreme stress of an accident, the brain fights terror with a strong blast of endorphins. The pleasant experiences are induced by endorphins. These are the brain's own natural morphine-like chemicals. And there's been at least one case of a man who was having a, a lovely experience in a heavenly place when he was injected with a morphine antagonist, a, a, an injection that would block the effects of these endorphins, and suddenly there were these terrible creatures coming at him, and it turned into a hellish NDE. So if you have a hellish NDE, it's probably simply because of the, uh, the different way your brain has reacted and whether it's produced enough endorphins or not to make you feel happy. Whatever the cause, Robert longed to regain that lost feeling of peace. It haunted his mind and became the focus of his life. He wanted to share what he felt was a wonderful experience but he had to keep it a secret, fearing that no one else would understand. As a teenager, I was obviously totally overwhelmed by it. And I was worried that if I told people, they would think I'd gone mad. But the memories became too powerful to ignore. He started to test himself, taking up dangerous sports where death is a real risk. What he wanted, was to find again that feeling of freedom from his childhood encounter with death. I asked myself, are you sure you want to give all this up? The experience then came up in me very strongly, and I thought, yes, I want to find out for myself what this means. American child psychologist PMH Atwater specializes in children who've had these encounters. It always changes them. After their experience is over, children invariably are more mature. Uh, they become much more adult-like. It's almost as if like they grow up. Sometimes art can provide much needed therapy. This painting by a Dutch woman recalls her childhood brush with death. It expresses the intense emotions of her experience. For a child, they will many times blame themselves for the experience ending. They'll think, well, I was a bad child, or what did I do wrong? Did I say something wrong? Why did all the people go away? 
Why did all the light beings go away? Where are the bright ones? Did I do something wrong? Atwater's long-term studies have shown that a high number of the children questioned were prone to drink or drug addiction later in life. A high proportion attempted suicide. Their experience has been too disturbing for them. The number one complaint that the children made was, I lost my childhood. She thinks it's difficult for them to stay on Earth once they've looked into the eyes of death. Nadia McCaffrey was one such child. When she was seven, her life changed forever. Out playing, she was stung by a poisonous snake. I felt this enormous pain on my left ankle. And I stopped, of course, froze. And I knew immediately what that meant. I knew immediately that I was facing death. For 10 days, she struggled for life. Finally, the doctors gave up hope. What happened was I left my body. Look at it, I was not interested by that at all. All I could see was this beautiful light this beautiful, powerful light, so full of love. She says she met a heavenly creature made of light who spoke to her. She, ve she was very, very clear on saying, you will not die, but I have to, to leave now. You cannot come with me. And you have a lot of things to do. You have to go back to life. Against the odds, Nadia survived, but she was changed. She no longer felt like a child and says she suddenly developed uncanny powers. I could hear some people's thoughts. I could feel people's pain. I could hear their sorrow. It was a torture. But I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And the only person really I trusted to talk to this experience was my grandmother. And when I told her, when I explained what, I, what happened to me, she looked at me and she very seriously said, don't you ever talk to anybody about this. They would think that you're crazy and you know, you would be put away, you would be locked up. Nadia McCaffrey shut herself off from the world. Life on Earth was not enough. She longed to return to the heavenly creature bathed in light. At 17, she decided to try. Her first suicide attempt failed, but shortly afterwards, she tried again. When I reached this light, there was no one there, no beam of light, just the white light. And I heard this enormous voice, this enormous voice, like a thunder coming from everywhere, but nowhere, kind of coming like this saying, you cannot stay here. You have not even begun your work yet. Oh, I thought to myself, here we go again. So I am very feisty and I argue with everything and everybody. I wanted to argue with this voice, but trust me, you don't, you don't argue with that voice. Nadia obeyed the voice and came back to Earth. When she woke, she was alone. The doctors had left the room, pronouncing her dead. But after this happened, I understood that, uh, you know, this, this was not a good idea. They don't want me. So I just have to be here, find my mission, do what I have to do, and I will never attempt suicide again. It's, it's useless. So she searched for her mission. She married and moved to San Francisco. In her 40s, she discovered what she had to do, help terminally ill patients come to terms with their own mortality. 25 years after her own near-death experience, Nadia has found peace. We have duties. We all have a mission. The point is to find what this mission is. 
Susan Blackmore's quest to understand her experience eventually led her to study the brain. She accepts people believe their impressions, but now can offer rational explanations. When your heart stops working and the oxygen stops getting to the brain, the brain will rapidly use up what little oxygen it's got and all the cells will start malfunctioning in different order. The smaller ones going first and the inhibitory systems going first. And then during this process there'll be a lot of random firing of cells because if the inhibition stops, lots of cells start randomly firing, get all sorts of strange things happening. Dutch neurologist Thomas Lempert's research is taking him into the same field. We made a young and healthy test person faint in a harmless way. Hyperventilation means breathing deeply while crouching down. Lempert's main focus is on epilepsy, which includes the effects of oxygen starvation on the brain. And then standing up quickly and pressing against the closed throat. That's enough to make a healthy person faint for a short moment, about 10 seconds. Many of the guinea pigs report experiences that sound remarkably similar to near-death experiences. One of them woke up and opened his eyes wide and said, this is unbelievable. He then explained how he saw a flood of pictures all in a row all with the feeling of being light and floating, and amongst his friends, he didn't want to leave. Another test person told us that it was wonderful. She didn't want to come back, really, and she thought that if she died right then, then all would be well. As the body's systems shut down, Lack of oxygen and blood flow causes the brain to release a flood of chemicals. One of these is the neurotransmitter glutamate, which can cause overactivation of cell receptors, leading to cell death. Other chemicals are released to fight this, and a side effect of this chemical intervention is an altered state of consciousness. A substance close to these transmitters is the anaesthetic ketamine. Tests on rats have proved that ketamine not only causes hallucinations, but also slows down the dying cells of the brain. In humans, it can produce all the features of an NDE. The ketamine model of the near-death experience is being studied by Dr. Carl Janssen from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in London. What is likely to be happening during a near-death experience is that the brain activates its own mechanisms and releases a number of substances that are neuroprotective. They protect the brain cells from damage due to the low oxygen, the low blood, the low blood sugar. Under those conditions, they protect it from damage. They bind to the same receptors, to the same place that ketamine binds to, and as a byproduct, they produce the psychological state, which is known as the near-death experience. So are near-death experiences the brain's furious struggle for survival? That theory answered a major question that the sort of pro-lifers, as they're known, the people who believe in life after death were always putting forward, which was, well, what is the evolutionary purpose of a near-death experience? Why should you be capable of this? And I would say, well, you're capable of this because it's a byproduct of the brain protecting itself from damage. And you would absolutely expect the brain to have mechanisms for protecting itself from damage. Dutch cardiologist Pim van Lommel is challenging the theory of the dying brain. For 13 years, he studied over 300 patients who had suffered heart and breathing failure for a prolonged period. To his surprise, only a very few reported near-death experiences. There was no explanation whatsoever. 
There was no difference between the 82% of patients who survived cardiac arrest without an NDE and the 80% who had an NDE. When it would have been a physiological explanation, say the anoxia of the brain, you would expect everybody to have that experience if the anoxia is the explanation. So Van Lommel concluded that oxygen starvation was not responsible for NDEs. When a pacemaker is implanted under a general anaesthetic, it triggers an artificial cardiac arrest. An EEG, a machine that registers tiny electrical signals coming from the brain cells and nerves, monitors activity. What you see that is after six. What you see is that after 6.5 seconds, the EEG started to show chemical responses. And then, at an average of 15 seconds, the EEG is flat. Van Lommel believes that on the brink of death, there is a six-second window when the brain is triggering specific chemicals that might cause hallucinations. But once that window closes and the brain shuts down, no more images or feelings can be received. But there are some cases which seem to defy this scientific logic. Vicky Umipeg from Seattle in the USA has been blind since birth. In January 1973, she was terribly injured in a car crash. I had a skull fracture, concussion, neck injury, back injury, leg injury, and I was dead for four minutes. Vicky's heart had stopped. Was she clinically dead or just in a deep coma? My back was up against the ceiling and then I was looking down at everything. The one doctor said, well, it's a pity now that she could be deaf as well as blind because there's blood on her left eardrum. And then the female doctor said, well, we don't even know if she's going to survive this coma. And if she does, she could be in a permanent vegetative state. And that made me mad. As she fought for her life, something even more extraordinary happened. Vicky could see for the very first time. I felt like it was a nightmare because I have never been accustomed to perceiving of anything from a distance and I touch things, I, I'm, my, my world is at arm's length. I'm, I perceive of everything tactily, and I couldn't translate what it was that I was receiving. And it was scary to be able to, a lot of people have asked me, well, wasn't it wonderful to see? Actually, no, it wasn't. It was terrible initially. I saw this ring on my left ring finger, and I thought, OK, that is me. And I also realized I, I had very long hair then down to my waist, and I realized that they'd shaved off quite a lot of it, and I was pretty upset about that. How could Vicky's blind eyes see? I mainly dream even with taste, touch, sound, and smell. But in my dreams, there is no light, no color, and there are no visual impressions. Vicky's experience interests scientists. She works with a psychologist from New York University specializing in the near-death experiences of the blind, Sharon Cooper. If you compared her case with many sighted near-death experiencers, you would not find differences. You, the only difference that I was able to discern between her case and a sighted person is her description of color. She called it different brightnesses of light, and that's because she had no way to understand what color was. She did notice differences in the environment during her experience. She just didn't know what to call them. Vicky Umipeg survived and returned to her world of darkness. She still has no doubt that for just a few minutes, 
she was able to see. I do know that there are many people who are going to be skeptical and who don't understand and who don't believe what I say, but I know what I experienced, I know what I saw, I know what I heard, I know what I felt. And so I just leave it at that. Vicky's story seems to challenge rational scientific explanation. And there are others. How does science explain another widely reported part of the near-death experience, floating outside the body? We know how the different experiences um, work in the brain and, and why they unfold in the way they do. You just have to have something that will trigger off that kind of natural human capacity. Cardiologist Pim van Lommel also has his own explanations about how images are received into a non-functioning brain. Till now we had a concept. Until now we had a concept that consciousness and memories are generated by your brain. If this concept is true, then it would not be possible to experience your full consciousness with memories from early childhood, with cognition, with emotion, with perception, above and beyond your body, during a period when your brain is not functioning. But if the brain is dead and unable to generate images, where do they come from? Van Lommel's controversial theory is that in some way consciousness exists outside the brain, something it can plug into. So I compare the brain with a kind of... So I compare the brain with a kind of receiver, as an interface, as a decoder for consciousness, to connect consciousness to our world. The internet you receive is not in your computer. When you switch your computer off, the internet is still everywhere. Everywhere where you put another computer on. If his theory is correct, then the visual components of NDEs are visions of an unplugged brain floating freely through a web of consciousness. Few agree. Many NDE researchers genuinely believe that consciousness can operate outside the brain. I think they're wrong. Ultimately, it's an empirical question, and we'll know the answer in the end. If I live long enough, I'll probably be able to look back and see, you know, they did or didn't find it. But right now, the evidence is not convincing at all to me, and I would say to the majority of scientists. And psychological studies have shown that believing imagined experiences to be true can lead to the development of false memory syndrome. People start thinking that events that never happened are real. Science is struggling to unlock the mystery of memory and consciousness. There's much we just don't understand. We do know that from early childhood the brain starts selecting some events to store. We don't know why that selection is made, how it's stored, or why some memories resurface. A world expert on this complex process is Nobel Prize winner, neurologist Philip Sharp. We believe those synaptic contacts between cells are modified by experience in a way that stores memory. There is probably also memory stored in the birth of new cells, and there may even be new mechanisms that we do not know about that stores memory. Uh, the, you know, the, the interesting thing about memory is it's got to span from the milliseconds to lifetimes. So is one mechanism uh, adequate to explain the, the memory of a second ago and the memory I have uh, of my childhood uh, 50 years ago. Uh, perhaps not. Many patients report that during an NDE, a lifetime's memories flash before their eyes. Can science explain what triggers this part of the experience? I saw everything in my life from my birth up until the car crash when I was 22 years old. I saw everything that I had been through. I saw people who had mistreated me. I saw people that I'd had wonderful experiences with. Everything. You feel it. You leave it. It's, it's within you. It's not just watching it with your eyes, okay? It's living it. 
We know uh, what, what sets it off. Uh, there are areas in the temporal lobes here above the ears where if you stimulate them electrically or with fluctuating magnetic fields, you can induce this life review. Um, so it seems that when you come close to death and there's this massive random firing of cells, if you've got that random firing happening in these parts of the temporal lobe, you will set off this review. But what if people see events during their life review that they could never have known before. Ever Terbeek from Holland learned entirely new things. That feeling that I had there had I never known. Up there, there is a feeling of unbelievable mutual love. I have never experienced this feeling since. But I still long for it. If you made me choose, even if my life here was really good and I had everything I could wish for. I would still, without hesitation, choose the other side, just for that feeling again. Now in his 70s, he has survived five heart attacks. The final one led to his NDE. He's tired of this life, as his wife Anne explains. But because he now has such a great desire to... He has such strong longings to go back to the afterlife that he has tried repeatedly to commit suicide. He then always lies down on the side where his heart is damaged. I have seen him do this several times. If I see that my husband is lying down on the wrong side to die, then I get onto my knees to beg him to turn around. October 99. Evert is in hospital with his fifth heart attack. The doctors have given up. I was against the ceiling, floating above my own body. I was actually floating over my body through the roof. At that moment, I had no idea that it was the roof of the hospital, but then I floated above it. I could still see everything that was happening in the hospital. I saw the doctors and the nurses standing by my bed. Suddenly, it all got smaller and smaller. It went so fast. While facing the light, Evert claims he heard a voice. She asks him what he's holding in his left hand. Glittering diamonds. Symbols of those he had loved and lost in his life. These are the feelings of people that I had to leave behind. The strange thing that happened that lunchtime was that the people I was thinking of all came to see me in hospital. On the very edge of death, Ever Tabik's whole long life passes by in front of his eyes, and old, hidden, secret wounds are reopened. Evert saw everything in his life, from birth to near death. Among familiar scenes, he saw a woman and a boy that he didn't recognize. There were people that I didn't know even existed. Yet I had this feeling that I had abandoned them. They said to me, you abandoned us when we needed you the most. And they were right. When Evert returned to life, he couldn't get the faces out of his mind. Dredging deep into distant memories, he began to recognize the woman, a long-lost lover. But who was the boy? Could it be his son? 
Kijk, van haar bestaan wist ik dus. Dat wil zeggen. I started to dig deeper into my memories. She had to be somewhere. Then I remembered her name and her life. It was then that I realized that my relationship with her had had serious consequences. A consequence that I didn't know anything about. Een gevolg waarvan ik dus mijn leven lang dus niet op de hoogte ben geweest. Evert eventually located his lost lover, and she confirmed his suspicions. He had fathered a son who had been dead for 30 years. He never knew his son existed, had never even seen him. When for the first time in the grass stond, was it a gevoel van. When I stood at his grave for the first time, I felt sadness and sorrow. It was a feeling that I had missed him for all those years, although I'd never met him. You question yourself about what could have been. This is such an enormous loss. It will haunt me for the rest of my life. The only help is to know that we will be united again one day. That's what I thought when I stood at my son's grave for the first time. But for skeptics, there is one insuperable problem. In spite of the advances of modern medicine, death is still final. It's still the one place from which no one can ever physically return. Susan Blackmore. We should always remember, of course, that the people who describe near-death experiences haven't actually died. They may have come very, very close to death. They may even, a few of them, have been clinically dead and there be no heart, no heartbeat, no um, brain signals. But they have come back, they haven't actually died. And we don't know and cannot know what happens to the people who really have died. As science unravels the brain's enigmas, the relationship between chemical reaction and NDEs is becoming clearer. But those who believe they have been to the other side of death are convinced their experiences are real. And there are still questions for which science seems to have no answer. A man recalling the son he never knew. A blind woman being able to see. Does the answer really lie in another world? It's very tempting to think that's what's happening as you come close to death, so that's what will happen afterwards. But there's no proof that it will. I've looked into hundreds of cases of, of this kind and the evidence doesn't seem to stand up. I think it's more wishful thinking. People want to believe. But um, let me see the evidence and then I'll change my mind. But returning through the gateway of death seems to overcome man's deepest fear. I'm not afraid of death, period. I'm not afraid of pain at all. Never, ever for one second did I regret having had the near-death experience. I feel that it was something that I needed to have in my life. And I think there's a much larger plan that we don't even know the full spectrum of. And I appreciate those I love and wanting to make the most of every moment that I have here because none of us is guaranteed tomorrow.